Uh, so uh, everyone, welcome to the uh, online uh, uh, to our online seminar. Uh, the speaker today is Matthew Carrier, who is currently a postdoc at Columbia University, and he's going to tell us about the metric distortion of embedding persistence diagrams into reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. I'm going to pass on the word to him. All right. Thank you, Tara, for the introduction. I hope uh, everyone can hear me well. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here. So thank you for inviting me uh, for presenting this uh, this summary, some kind of summary of the works I've done, especially on the field of kernel methods and, and persistence diagrams within the past few years. So the title is kind of um, precise, but in this talk, I would like also to give some kind of general overview of uh, how machine learning and especially kernel methods combine or mix with uh, TDA and their main descriptors, persistence diagrams. So I think I'll, I'll first uh, give some, you know, recall the basics of kernel methods. So, and, so Matthew, and, have, you, have you shared your slides? Oh, um, I don't know. Can you see the slides? No? No. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I see. Okay, very good. Word. Yeah, now we can see the slides. Right. You can see the slides? Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, I, was, I will first uh, recall the basics of kernel methods, give you, so that we're on the same page. Um, also, you know, recall what persistence diagrams and TDA uh, actually, uh, you know, what kind of computation do they do? What kind of descriptor they encode? And then we'll, we'll see how they combine and what kind of questions rise when we try to mix those fields together. So <clears throat> just uh, to give you a little you know, context, I would like to recall the big, like the big problem we're trying to solve here. So kernel methods and TDA are all part of data science. And in this talk, I will focus on machine learning where we want basically to do some kind of uh, classification or regression problems, where the, the problem is that you have some kind of data uh, data points. And what you want to do is uh, solve some kind of classification or a prediction problem where you want to predict either you know, a real value if you're doing regression or um, an element in a discrete space, which are the labels. So for instance, you, you may want to you know, distinguish images, classify, you know, representing horses from dogs, from cats. And the, the, the whole goal of, of supervised machine learning is to you know, leverage, leverage the fact that you know the answer for, for some data that you call the training that set to build a so-called classifier that will do the prediction. So again, either represent the function or at least find the boundaries between the different uh, labels. OK, so. Most of the machine learning problems actually, you know, take the, the following form. What you want to do is actually minimize some kind of loss function, uh, which is, you know, find the, 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 you know, the predictor function that minimizes this loss. Well, the loss is actually the sum of some L function that we call the, well, the loss actually, and omega that we call a regularizer. So usually the loss function represents, you know, the error that sorry, the error that you make on your data. So it's a measure, it's a function measuring the difference between the true value yi and your prediction f of xi on the training data. And omega is well, it's a regularizer, and you want this function because otherwise you would do what is called overfitting, meaning that it's kind of, you know, it's it's possible to find a function that has zero training error or zero loss function, but that is not very robust. Like if you take the, the red function here, you know, it has zero training error, but if you draw another test point, it's very likely that uh, you will make a bad prediction, it's not a very robust function. So really regularization is to, is to make things robust. So those are examples of possible loss functions. Well, you can see then, you know, depending on the loss you use, you have different uh, machine learning algorithms. So if you're doing the hinge, if you're trying to minimize the hinge loss function, you get the traditional support vector machines. But, you know, there are other choices like exponential loss function. And then in that case, you get boosting algorithms and so on. 
Same thing for the regularization, there are possible choices. Actually, not that much. The most common choices are minimizing the norms. Oh yeah, so I forgot to mention, but in that case, it, it, it's very common to parameterize your function f with some, you know, some parameters or the value that belong to a Euclidean space. And then uh, the regularization you know, amounts to minimizing, you want to minimize the norm of your, of your uh, parameters, of your function parameters. And they may have different properties, like if you're using the one norm, you get you know, a sparse vector, you're forcing many coefficients, many W coefficients to be zero. Whereas if you take the L2 norm, then things become convex, differentiable. So, you know, usually people use a trade-off between the two, like some kind of mix that uh, that is called elastic net. But anyway, this is really um, the, the, the problem we're trying to solve. Now, <clears throat> the main motivation between, you know, kernel methods is the following fact. Uh, well, of course, it's kind of obvious that if your f, if, if your function space is too big, then the minimization is going to be very hard because you will have a lot of functions to search in. Whereas things become easier if f is actually a so-called reproducing kernel here the space. So let's see how it looks. So this is the definition actually. So uh, here, what is a Reproducing kernel Hilbert space. It's actually a, you know, a Hilbert space of function going from your data, your space of data X to R. So Hilbert space with some dot product. And it's in particular, it's a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. If you can define what well, a similarity function K sometimes, so often called a kernel, which satisfies the two following uh, equations that you're seeing. So basically, it just means that if you take a function in your Hilbert space, then evaluating it on a point amounts to take this, taking the scalar product of f with the kernel restricted, with the first element restricted to the, the point uh, we're, we're looking at. All right, so again, Hilbert space is just a Hilbert space of function, and it's a kernel Hilbert space if you can define some kind of k function which satisfies condition e and uh, to i and to i. Now, uh, very briefly, because uh, I won't, don't want to go into details, but you, you can prove there is a lot of theory between you know behind those spaces. You can show, for instance, that you know if you get uh, uh, RKHS, then its corresponding kernel is unique, and in the other way around, uh, <clears throat> if you if you have a function k that is a kernel, then it is the kernel of at most one RKHS up to some isomorphism. But really, what is really what's more important, maybe in at least for a practical point of view, is the following theorem, where you can actually characterize kernel with positive definiteness. <clears throat> so instead of you know defining a Hilbert space H and finding a function k satisfying the the conditions, it's way easier to actually, you know, to use the property that tells you that if your function k is positive definite, then you know that there exists, it is a kernel. So it means that there exists some Hilbert space H for which k is the kernel of H. And positive definiteness is much easier to check, easier to check. You just need, you know, to satisfy the positive definite equality, inequality for any, you know, set of uh, points and coefficients. And finally, those are um, three examples, classical examples of kernels where when you're you know, doing, um, when you're studying points in, in RD, like if, if X is RD, Euclidean space, then you have the three following examples which are, which are very common, uh, linear, polynomial, and Gaussian kernels. So uh, that's now the main reason why uh, I said that you know, minimiz minimization is easier in RKHS. It's because of this theorem, which is called actually the representer theorem, that tells you that uh, if now you're trying to minimize your, you know, loss function, but restricting f to be part of uh, RKHS, then you know that the the solution of your problem is only is nothing but a combination, like a linear combination, of uh, well of your kernels restricted on the first element to the element of the tuning space. 
And what you just have to minimize over the alpha variables. So the problem becomes, you know, a linear optimization problem. And what's also interesting is that if you want to solve this, you only need to know the kernel values on each pair of training points. So if you are able to build the kernel matrix, then you can minimize uh, the, you know, the big problem, the loss function, get the optimal F star function with the optimal alpha, and finally get your uh, predictor. And Matthew, so now, and, and there's a number of yep. and there's a yes, number of data points, so you exactly. need to you need the number of points. Yeah, so you have as many variables. That determines the number of coefficients you need to right. learn. Exactly. So the you know this is also one drawback is that you you have as many parameters as you have training points. So depending on your training data sets, you may have different number of parameters. Also one one you know one limitation of this approach is that you know when you get a new test point and you want to classify it, you need to evaluate the kernel value between your test points and all of the training points. So you know as your that training data set increases, things become more and more computationally expensive. Um, but that being said, another reason why kernel methods can be very interesting is that you can actually see them as some kind of embeddings into uh, possibly finite or infinite dimensional space. So again, if I call kx the kernel function, you know, when I restrict the first element to the x uh, to, a, to a fixed training point x, then I have a function. And actually, so, uh, you can see this function as you know the um, the transformation of your point x in into uh, a f the infinite Hilbert space of function. So again, what I mean is that you can just see kernels as a way to embed your features into an infinite dimensional space. And it's interesting because even if your data training data set is kind of uh, tricky, like in, in the one I'm showing, you know, there is no clear linear separation from the red to the blue points. It's possible that if you embed your points in a hit, you know, infinite dimensional space, things become linearly separable. And then with you know a traditional SVM, you can really easily solve the problem. So in this example, I just took, I think, a polynomial kernel to you know uh, embed my points in R3 instead of R2, and just increasing the dimension by one uh, made all things separable. So the idea is that you just have to now solve the optimization problem in R3 instead of R2, where things are uh, much nicer. Okay, so that was all for you know the, the basics of kernel methods. Um, now, again, the, the purpose of this talk is to see how those combine with uh, persistence and topological data analysis. So I've prepared a few slides about persistence diagrams, though I assume that uh, many of you are already familiar with this. So I will go very fast on this. Um, just to recall what persistence is, uh, what persistence diagrams is, so that we're all on the same page here. So very briefly, <clears throat> the goal of TDA is to encode, uh, like to compute features out of your training data set that actually encode information that is of topological nature. So usually the, the, the way to encode this information is in a set of points in the plane, like the one you're seeing on the bottom right. And what you need to compute such a diagram, which is so it's called a persistence diagram, is just in addition to your you know data set data space x, you also need a function f. And as soon as you get this, uh, you can compute such a diagram. And again, briefly, the idea uh, of the computation, the persistence computation, is just to track to look at all the sublevel sets of f and track the topological changes. So again, like in this small example, I, my, my input space X of data is actually the real line, R. So R itself has no, you know, a lot of interesting topology, but if you define a function on it, a, a continuous function, this function may have bumps, right, peaks, and those bumps and peaks are actually topological features that you can encode in a diagram. So that's why you can also see persistence, you know, as a way to encode topological information from the point of view of some function F. So this is the example of computation. The gray area here is the sublevel set of a fixed threshold alpha. And what we're going to do is to increase alpha from minus infinity to plus infinity. 
and see uh, you know, what, what topological changes happen. So for this value of alpha, for instance, the sublevel set is empty because there is no point in X whose function value is, um, is uh, less than the threshold. At this value, I have one point in the sublevel set, not one point, but a whole segment, but still just one connected component. At this value, I add a second connected component, third one here. At this value, the third connected component becomes merged to the first one. So we stop. Uh, so you know, each time we created a connected component, we started an interval, and each time the connected component gets merged, we stop the corresponding interval. I do that until plus infinity. And the way to get the diagram is to just you know, uh, use the, the endpoints of each interval as the coordinates of a point in the plane, and then you get a diagram. So those are uh, very brief results. Those are a few examples just to see you know, how one can use, make use of diagrams in, in more applications. So this is kind of a, this is still a synthetic example where here I'm sampling the torus. Uh, and I'm taking as a function the distance to the point cloud. So it just means that if you're looking at sublevel sets, while well, you have balls, right, centered on the points, and the radii of the ball, of the balls is going to grow. And we're interesting of the topology of this union of balls, and you can see that you know, a way to, well, you, you have the intervals here uh, at the bottom of the slides. Uh, so I separated between the different dimensions, but you can see that, for instance, you have two long bars in dimension one, meaning that you have two loops in the torus, the handle and the inside. And there's also one bar in dimension two, which is the inside of the torus. Another maybe more interesting example here is one of the first projects I've worked on, where uh, I was actually doing classification on 3D shapes. So the goal here was to characterize points on 3D shapes. So not the whole shape itself, but rather the points on the shapes. For instance, here I have human shapes, human shapes, and what I'm interested in is to classify the points, you know, depending on the part of the shape to which they belong. So it can be either the head, the foot, the hand, the torso, and so on. So of course, you cannot use the coordinates of the points, right? Because they depend on the embedding. So it's not going to be a very robust or efficient feature. But another possibility is actually to compute a persistence diagram. You can do that by looking at the uh, the distance, the geodetic distance function to the point you're interested in. So again, if you fix a point on a shape, you can grow a geodetic ball around this point. That gives you a function and get the diagram of this, this point. So now you have one diagram per point, which is intrinsic, meaning that it doesn't depend on the abelian. It just depends on the geodetic distance. And well, again, uh, diagrams are similar if you would take points from similar parts of the shapes. So it's kind of a useful feature for doing classification. Now, uh, last example, uh, something I'm actually working on right now is where now you have um, magnetic resonance images, so MRIs, which are actually 3D images with voxels. And you get a function associated to each voxel by just taking the amount of uh, gray matter of the brain. Uh, that gives you so, and again, as soon as you have a function and a space x, here x is R3, then you can compute a diagram and see in, in this particular project, we're trying to distinguish between patients that have autism from normal control patients using the diagrams computed on the MRIs. Okay, and last thing uh, I want to mention is this uh, stability theorem. So this is one of the reasons why diagram, persistence diagrams are becoming popular in, in TDA and more generally data science, is this robustness to perturbations of your function. Again, if you take different functions, but close, close ones, then the persistence diagrams that you get are going to be close as well uh, with respect to their uh, the infinity distance, which is called the bottleneck distance. Uh, that I will actually, yeah, I will define it uh, right now. So, but just as a quick summary <clears throat> for now, we've seen kernel methods, we've seen diagrams. Now the question is, you know, how to combine the two. So let me summarize also what what's the distance is, because one of the questions we're going to look at is also what happens 
you know, when we embed, assuming we have a kernel for diagrams, then it means that we're going to embed the diagrams into some Hilbert space. One question would be what happens uh, with the metric? Like we have a metric between diagrams with some properties like stability properties. Are these properties still going to be preserved in the, in the Hilbert space? So first, uh, last thing I, I wanted just to, you know, briefly recall what the metric is between diagrams. It's roughly uh, um, a transportation, you know, optimal transportation metric where you just try to find matching with, assuming you have two diagrams, like the blue and the red ones here, you want to find the best matching between the points, the red points and the blue points. And since the diagrams may have different number of, you know, of points, you are also allowed to match points to the diagonal so that you get the matching. The cost of the matching is computed as, you know, the sum or the maximum of uh, all the smaller costs, you know, the cost of each match between each pair of points. And you and the distance is computed by taking uh, the best optimal matching, the cost of the best optimal matching. So usually the, um, those distances are called Wasserstein distances for diagrams. So in this presentation, I will call them diagram distances instead, because I'm go also going to speak about Wasserstein distance, but you know, the Wasserstein distance between probability distributions. So I don't want to make, you know, to, to mix things up. So instead of, again, instead of calling this distance Wasserstein distance for diagrams, I'll call them diagram distances. And this is the overall, you know, uh, the overall uh, cartoon of the problem we're trying to solve. We have diagrams, we have tasks on which we build diagrams, on which we use kernels. And finally, with this kernel, by minimizing the function, the loss function, we get a predictor uh, to do some classification. All right, so there are possibly two possible ways to do, uh, you know, to build a kernel for diagrams. You can either explicitly define the embedding going from your diagram space to your Hilbert space, or you can use the so-called Berg theorem. I mean, I, I'm not sure that these are the only two ways, but these are the two main common ways, most common ways. And very briefly, the Berg theorem tells you that if you have a, you know, some kind of metric or similarity function on your space D, which is CNSD, mean, meaning conditionally negative semi-definite, then you can, you know that the exponential of this D function is going to be a kernel. So you have a RKHS associated to it. And CNSD just means minimizing this equation. Uh, now, the problem is a little tricky for diagrams because the diagram distances are not CNSD actually, but we'll see how to cope with this. Uh, there's um, you know, a big line of work on you know, thinking about how to embed diagrams in Hilbert spaces. Actually, this, the list I'm showing is not up to date because last year, many, several more possibilities were presented in different conferences such as and you know nips for instance uh, but you can see that roughly you have uh, you have different you know ways to think of diagrams you can think of them as you know triangle functions this is the landscapes you can think of diagrams as measures finite metric spaces um, or you know um, roots or elements of uh, topical polynomials or complex polynomials that you want to evaluate on the diagrams. Uh, in this talk, I will present the, the work I've worked. Uh, I mostly present the, the works I've worked on. So basically, an explicit embedding into RD uh, by considering the diagrams as finite metric spaces and a Gaussian kernel uh, using the Berg theorem. Also, Actually, let me for a second. Yep, sure, yeah. If you go back one more slide to the theorem on the prior slide, yes. yeah, this theorem. So mm -hmm. um, I know usually you want kernels to be positive definite. You know, the, the way this theorem is, is phrased, it's sort of implying that distances are usually, you know, uh, negative definite. Uh -huh. um, um, uh, is, how should I think about that? You know, are, are distances often negative definite? I mean, they're, why should I think of distances well, as typically? It's kind of hard to say. Well, one thing that I can say is that if you take, for instance, the Euclidean distance, uh, between points in Euclidean space, it's it is CNSD. Like if you write it down, it's kind of uh, 
I guess it's not that hard to show. Uh, it's, it's actually a good exercise, but in general, it's kind of hard to say. Um, and does it relate to the curvature of a space at all? Like if I know my space is positively curved or negatively curved, does, does that tell me whether I should expect the distance to maybe be conditionally mm -hmm. negative semi-definite? So actually not, not exactly. So I, I first, I, I was, you know, this is the way I thought about it at first. It, it's, it's kind of, you know, this kind of inequality is similar to the, you know, the equalities you want to show when you want to show that the space is Alexandrov or a positive curvature or so on. So those things like curvature and CNSD are definitely related, but there is no clear uh, equivalence or relation between those two. Uh -huh, uh -huh. It's, you, you can show either negatively or positively curved uh, space, I think, with either CNSD or not CNSD metric. It, it, it's, at least to me, it's a little unclear what's, what's really you know, the relation between those two. And I don't have a lot of intuition between, you know, for this CNSD notion of metric. Uh, again, um, I guess what was possible to say is that the more you add structure in your space, the more likely you are to be CNSD. Uh -huh. And uh, the best example is the Euclidean space where everything is well structured. And CNSD is kind of easy to show. Very cool. Thanks. Well, yeah. Uh, the, the problem here for diagrams is that we're dealing with kind of complicated metrics by looking at, you know, uh, best matching between points. So it's, I guess this is why it's kind of hard to show that the thing is actually it's not CNSD, but I, I guess one of the reasons is that the, the metric is itself uh, not that simple. Mm. All right, so yeah, so this is a small table we, you know, summarizing the kind of properties we're looking at when we're defining kernels in general. So of course you want to be positive definite, kind of nice if you also know what Hilbert space you're in. You know, since diagrams are stable, you may, you also want some kind of stability of your embedding, meaning that the norm of the distance in your Hilbert space is bounded from above by the diagram distance. Uh, but you also may want, you know, to look at the other way around, like to see if your Hilbert distance can actually be lower bounded. And you can see that, of course, this is a much more uh, tricky question. Uh, it's kind of okay to show that most approaches are injective, but showing a lower bound on the distance is kind of a difficult problem. Okay, let's go for the first example. So this is... Uh, Again, one of the first projects I worked on when I was a PhD student, a way to turn a vector into a fixed dimensional vector space. So the, again, when I said I was considering diagrams as finite metric spaces, I just meant that we're going to characterize the diagram with the distance matrix. And really the, the process is kind of easy. You take the distance matrix, you sort the distances so that you get a sorted sequence. And then you truncate. Um, usually, when you have, you know, you have a, a bunch of diagrams. So what's what's very common to do is to take the diagrams with the, you know, the maximum number of points, because this is going to be the diagram with the longest vector, and just pad all the other diagrams with zero values. Now, one problem with this simple definition is that maybe it's too simple because, for instance, it doesn't take into account the diagonal. Whereas when you're comparing diagrams, you are allowed to match points to the diagonal. So in itself, this definition, this vector is not uh, stable, like the metric property is not preserved. So that's why, uh, okay, <laughs> there's a little problem in the slides, but very briefly, just we, we just likely modify this, this transformation to make it stable. So instead of taking the distance matrix, the entry in position ij is just going to be the minimum between the actual distance in the plane and the distances to the diagonal of each point. So you take the minimum of those three elements, that gives you your dij, and then again, you sort your distances and you truncate to get a vector. And by doing this, you can show that, uh, well, you have something that is stable uh, with a universal bound in the bottleneck distance. Uh, if you're using you know, more general diagram distance, the bound becomes uh, 
worse. Oh, sorry, there's a, a mismatch of the notations here. So the upper bound here, D, because I use the same letter for both the diagram and the bound. So D here is the dimension of the uh, ambient space. So it's the length of the finite dimensional vector. And you can see that, you know, as, as P gets bigger, um, what things can go, can go bad, but you still have some kind of stability. This is a small illustration where, you know, again, I computed diagrams for each point of different shapes and I plotted coordinates of this vector. And well, this is an illustration of stability, right? If you take similar shapes and points on similar parts of the shapes, then they have similar values. Um, but now, so that was, so in, in that way you get a vector. Now, another possibility, as I mentioned before, is to use uh, Berg theorem, building a Gaussian kernel for diagrams. And for this, we're going to see diagrams as uh, measures. And why is, so when I say this, I just means that each diagram, which is a set of points, is going to be turned into a measure by looking at sums of direct measures centered on the points. And that's interesting because, you know, I was mentioning before the Wasserstein distance between measures. Well, this Wasserstein distance has many good properties, and we'll see that one of them is to be almost CNSD. Uh, and it also looks a lot like the diagram distance that we're currently using. The on, actually, the only difference is that we're not matching points to the diagonal. When you're doing Wasserstein distance between distributions, you need your clouds, your point clouds to have the same number of points. But apart from this, you also want to find the best matching between the points. So again, those distances are different because there is no notion of diagonal in the Wasserstein distance. But uh, you can cope with this by just, in addition to the original measure defined with the diagram, define an additional measure by taking Dirac's centered on the projections of the points of the diagrams to the diagonal. So now you have a measure mu plus and a measure mu minus associated to a diagram. And then, uh, well, you can found, you can see that there is a natural equivalence, strong equivalence between the Wasserstein, between the diagram distance and the Wasserstein computed on the, the mu plus of one diagram plus the mu minus on the second and mu plus of the second plus mu minus of the first. So again, this is a very simple property, very easy to show. And, you know, it tells you to, you know, to use Wasserstein distances uh, and preserve probability, like the proper metric properties of the diagrams. Now, one last problem is that W in general is not CNSD, but there is a classic trick in optimal transport uh, by taking, you know, which is called slicing and relying on the fact that the Wasserstein computed on measures which are unidimensional, so measures of points sampled on lines, is actually CNSD. Because the, the best ordering is given by uh, sorting the points along the lines and matching the points according to this order. And if you do that, then the Wasserstein distance only becomes a one, like the L1 distance between the corresponding vectors, which is CNSD. So finally, this is what we do for diagrams. We define the slash Wasserstein distance between diagram R's, well, the Wasserstein distance between the previous probability measures uh, sliced, you know, projected on, on, uh, on a line theta and you integrate over all possible lines. And by linear linearity of integration, uh, you get a distance that is still CNSD. That has a lot of good properties, but uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. And of course, you get a Gaussian kernel with this. And finally, um, one good property, with, last good property with this last Wasserstein distance is that you can also show in addition to the upper bound, uh, a lower bound, which is not perfect because it's, you can see that it's quadratic in the number of points in the diagrams, but that still, it's, it's still better than just being injected. Uh, very briefly, this is a small illustration of, of this kind of uh, metric preservation properties. So here I'm plotting, so, do, so you, well, okay, there are several things on this plot. So first, each point here represents uh, a pair of diagrams. In the abscissa, you, you have the original diagram distance and the ordinate, you have the, you know, the Hilbert distance. 
and you have different colors because I'm comparing different kernels here. So you may have different kernels, you may have different Hilbert, Hilbert uh, distances. So the fact that for some kernels, the distribution of points is scattered just means that, well, basically for some points, you, you may, you, it's, for some kernels, it's easy to find diagrams which are at strictly positive distance, but almost zero in the Hilbert distance. Again, an illustration of the fact that the prop metric properties are not well preserved. Whereas if you have a kernel that for which the distribution is not that scattered, it means that, well, in some sense, metric properties are, are, are better preserved. Um, maybe one last thing. This is a particular example on a specific application. I'm not sure that it's always true that slice that Sunshine, you know, preserves distances as well as this every time, but at least on this application, it's rather clear that you, you have a good preservation. Uh, so this was, they, these are a table of results showing that it's also, you know, that the Sunshine also makes a good performance when you're actually doing classification on, on some test data set. But, Matthew, can, can uh, I interrupt for a second? Sure. Yes, yeah, so on the on the prior slide with the colors, so, um, D one is in some sense the like the ground truth that you're trying to recover, is that right? Right. Yeah. That exactly. red recovers the slice wazer time recovers really well. Like the the blue in some sense sh should I should I think of like it's fair to rescale the blue and then compare the blue to the black? Like maybe we shouldn't be comparing. Yeah. The blue. Yeah. So I guess to be maybe a little more uh, fair, what you can do is rescale a little. Um, that's what we mean, right? Yeah. Right. But but when you rescale, the blue is still going to be you know spread out a lot like the green is, I, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. I think I separate. You know, I put the blue higher just you know so that you don't have all colors mixed up. I see. I see. I see. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Uh, yeah. You, you you can definitely you know by you know subtracting a, a constant and make it you know aligned with the other um, with the other kernels. Mm. So yeah, um, so this, for instance, is an example coming from um, one of the first uh, methods of vectorizing vectors, uh, you know, persistent images, where <clears throat> what's, what we're trying to do here is to classify orbits of a discrete dynamical system. And what you do is to predict the R parameter of this dynamical system. And the reason is that depending on R, you may have or not uh, some kind of holes in the orbits, something that you can detect with uh, with diagrams. And then, well, you know, we're doing machine learning, so we have to show that we're better than the others. So in that example, size by such time performs quite well. Also, what's interesting is that on the computation, you know, computation as um, side, you just need to compute if you want to do some kind of, you know, optimize it, like it's, it's very usual in, in kernel methods that you try to optimize also on the bandwidth of the Gaussian kernel that you're using. Um, so that in in our case, if you're doing slice Wasserstein, you just need to compute the slice Wasserstein distances. And then, I mean, my point is that you don't have to recompute the whole kernel matrix every time you want to change the bandwidth. Whereas for the, you know, the competitors uh, at the time, like the persistent scale space and weighted Gaussian kernel. If you're really doing brute force validation, well, you need to recompute the matrix. So there is also a, an, an improvement on the computational side. Uh, this other example was the one I mentioned before, when you want to minimize, you know, to classify points on 3D shapes, depending on the parts to which they belong. So again, there's a bunch of results depending on the class of shapes we're trying to, you know, segment, to do segmentation on. And, uh, well, not all the time, but many times, uh, says the such and performs well. All right, so now the last thing I wanted to, you know, uh, discuss is the general question of, you know, this kind of metric preservation, right? So, in general, the question is what happens when you send persistent diagrams, you turn persistent diagrams into elements of a Hilbert space. And what we're interested in, since you know we want to preserve the metric properties of diagrams, is equivalences of metrics. 
And by an equivalent, I mean, well, two metrics are equivalent if, you know, there are some fixed positive, strictly positive constants, and of course not infinite, uh, such that one metric is, all, is lower bounded and upper bounded by the other. Um, the first, you know, the result, the main result that um, Uli and I have been working on last year was uh, the following one, actually. So <clears throat> if you want, you know, um, a Hilbert space in which the Hilbert metric is equivalent to, your, to the original diagram distance, well, first, if your Hilbert space is RD, then it's not going to be possible. And uh, in more generally, if your Hilbert space is separable and you're trying to preserve the, the first diagram distance, well, then either the lower bound goes to zero or the upper bound goes to plus infinity as the number of points uh, increases. So this is also an illustration of, you know, slide Wasserstein, for instance. Like the slide Wasserstein's distance was upper bounded, by, but the lower bound went to zero. Um, as n goes to infinity. <clears throat> and maybe also interestingly, in, if you look at the first element of this proposition, doesn't depend actually on the dimension of the unmailing. So it, it means that even if you restrict two diagrams with just, I don't know, one point in them, and you unbend them into r at the power r to the 1000, then it's still not got not possible to get an equivalence between you know the Euclidean distance in R to the thousand and the diagram distance. Uh, okay, so these are a very short you know, um, <clears throat> elements for the proofs. So we'll start with two the second element of the proposition, which is actually can not that hard to show. Um, so if you want, so again the idea is that you know. Um, we, the idea is that we cannot have an equivalence because if your Hilbert space is separable, then if your metrics are equivalent, it means that your original diagram space is also going to be separable. And uh, the space of diagrams with the D1, the first diagram distance, diagrams with possibly countably many, but possibly infinite, at most countably many number of points um, is not separable. And an easy way to show where it's it's kind of easy to build a counter example. Um, the in in the proof what we use is that um, we take actually a family of diagrams indexed by the space of sequences, uh, actually Boolean sequences, so integer sequences taking values in either zero or one. And each element of uh, my set my set uh, S is going to be a diagram for which the point k and k plus one over k is included if and only if the corresponding element of the sequence is one. So of course there is, uh, you know, a not, there is an infinite number of such, you know, sequences taking value zero and one. Actually there is, a, there are, uh, you know, uncountably many. And it's kind of easy to show that if your space was of part of diagrams was separable, then you would have for each diagrams for each diagram in that space, you would have one unique element of the you know countable set that you are supposing if you assume that your space is separable. And since you have incountable sequences, number of sequences, then uh, there is going to be a contradiction. This is restricted. This is restricted to um, the first diagram distance and separable Hilbert space. Um, we've been working on generalization of this, but it's kind of a tough question. So, for the general case, this is the 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 most we've accomplished right now. Now, maybe what's a little more interesting is that is the case of the Euclidean space. This time, instead of using um, separability, we're using the so-called Aswa dimension, which is also sometimes referred to as the doubling dimension. And which roughly, you know, amounts to counting. You can estimate this dimension in a space X, actually the metric space X, by you know, if you fix um, a ball of radius R, you want to know how many balls of radius 
beta r you need to cover this ball. And beta here is a coefficient between 0 and 1. And this is roughly what it, what it computes. And of course, you know, in Euclidean space, the Atua dimension is, is the dimension of the space. And this dimension is preserved by equivalent metrics. So the idea here of the proof is to show that where, well, you know, the Aswa dimension of Euclidean space is D, is finite. <clears throat> and only, so since the, the Aswa dimension of diagram is not, uh, there's going to be a contradiction. So all we have to do is show that the Aswa dimension of the diagram space is infinite. Again, it, it amounts to show that if you fix, you know, to find the ball in the space of persistence diagrams, which will need increasingly number of, of smaller balls to cover. Uh, so this is the example. So here, what we're actually doing is that we're taking a ball on the empty diagram, so a diagram with zero points, and the ball of these diagrams roughly look like, you know, um, some kind of... <clears throat> thickening of the diagonal. And we're going to cover this blue, uh, this blue band with uh, smaller balls centered on points of diagonal, so centered on, on other diagrams. And the diagrams we're going to consider to cover the, the blue ball are diagrams with just one point that are actually uh, at the very limit of the blue band and are, that are sufficiently away from each other. So it's kind of easy, I mean, easy. You, you, can, you can show that um, is beta when beta goes to zero. If, if you take beta sufficiently small, then you will need uh, more and more balls to cover the blue region. And you, that, that way you can make the Aswa dimension increase to plus infinity and then get uh, you know, a, a contradiction showing that you cannot have any equivalence. This is a small illustration of this. So here I'm, I'm just, this is a synthetic example where I'm just generating uh, points in the unit upper half square. And I'm trying, and I'm looking at the distribution of, of the ratio between the distances. So here I'm comparing the distances in, um, in the Hilbert space, the ratio of the Hilbert distance and the original diagram distance. And I'm doing that for different kernels. So here I'm just plotting, I think, landscape, uh, slice Wasserstein, and you know the finite metric embedding that I showed you earlier. Um, and for an increasing uh, number of points in the diagram. And it's, well, you can see that, you know, well, first the distribution gets more and more scattered. Well, not for the slice Wasserstein, but for the two others. And the median of the distribution is is strictly increasing. Again, this is just an illustration of of the previous uh, statement. Yeah, so I think that's that's all um, I wanted to say for uh, this kind of of uh, you know general properties of embeddings of diagrams. So as you can see, the diagrams, the result we have in general are, are uh, negative for now. Uh, but this is still um, a problem that we're looking at because in gen in the general case it's it's still a little unclear you know whether this kind of results negative results still hold or not and uh, yeah and it's for now it's still an open question so yeah so that's that's all I wanted to say so thank you very much and uh, I'll be happy to take questions if some of you have some thank you so much. Uh, I guess it's time for questions. <clears throat> I'll start off with a question. So, Matthew, on your mm -hmm. on your second to last slide, um, yep, uh, we'll go one further. One. Um, another further, the one with the plots and the error bars. Um, yeah, keep going. Oh, the one with the, yep. The plots and what, sorry? Which, the which error bars? bars. It's like the slide right before your thank you slide. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, here. 
So um, I see the spread stay nice and tight for the uh, slice Wasserstein kernel. What what are the axes again? The axis, you mean? Yeah, what's the horizontal? Okay, so here, well, um, vertical axis. so the idea to generate this plus is that, so in the abscess, I'm increasing the number of points in the diagrams. So let's, so we're either, you know, looking at diagrams with 10 points, like at most 10 points, or at most 20 or 30 or until 100 points. And on the ordinates, so for, again, so for each cardinality, like 10, 20, 30, I uniformly generate a family of like thousand diagrams, right? By just by uniform sampling over the unit upper half square, right. and on this family of diagrams, I compute all pairwise distances. That gives me a distribution of value, and I I'm see. plotting, um, you know, the median, like, and the, you know, and the the quartiles, uh, sorry, the percentiles of these distributions. So for instance, uh, for instance, the fact that the you know the percentiles goes they go you know the, the the well you can see from the percentiles that the range of the distribution gets wider for uh, for instance for the landscapes but also for for the third plot. Whereas right, it's like as you as you have as you add more and more points to the left and the right method, you're getting in, mm -hmm. in some sense more and more uncertainty. Exactly. Yeah. So it, it's kind of interesting to note that if you're comparing, you know, if you're looking at the slice versus chain distance, like the, the range of distribution actually looks, um, looks constant, you know, while well, the median is still increasing, but uh, yeah, so <clears throat> kind of interesting to notice. I don't have a clear explanation for this right now, but. That's interesting, thanks. Kind of interesting, yeah. Mm. Uh, so what did you say that you're looking at right now? You said that sort of despite like the like answer being negative that you're still oh, yeah. like... Uh, there, are, there are a couple of questions we're looking at. Um, well, first, you know, if you look at condition 2i, uh, it's kind of very restricted because you need your Hilbert space H to be separable. If mm -hmm. you think about it, um, if you think about it, actually, this second condition, it doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, encompass a lot of, of kernels because <clears throat> mm -hmm. many kernels, for instance, uh, like for instance, the PSS or the PWG kernel, they already mm -hmm. assume that they have a finite number of points. Otherwise, they're not even well defined. Mm -hmm. um, and in that setting, uh, in that setting, uh, sorry, what are they? Yeah, I think they assume that the number of points is fixed. But again, the, the, the point is, is that for many kernels, the space H is actually not separable. Okay. Uh, you, you can make it with some weighting of the points in the diagram and so on, but this theorem is, is not very, very general. Well, mm -hmm. still, it, you know, it encompasses some, of it. there are some cases that are included in it, like for instance, uh, landscapes or uh, other approaches, but I have the feeling that it's, it's there's still a lot of you know improvement that can be done on on, on this side. Okay. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah, on the Euclidean space, it's kind of the question is, is actually kind of solved because it, the results kind of general. It's not. It's also not that surprising, right? Because we're comparing diagrams with a kind of optimal transport metric, which is mm -hmm. you know intrinsically very different from Euclidean space Euclidean metrics. But for infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, uh, yeah, I think there's still a some kind of, of, of work and uh, mm -hmm. things to do. So I also get the feeling that it can be related as we you know, discussed earlier to the curvature of the space. Like if you mm -hmm. look, if you try to see if the Hilbert space is Alexandrov or not, probably has an influence on the, on, on this kind of, you know, metric equivalence properties, but still is, it's, it's still a little unclear uh, right now, but it, it's, it's something where, that's yeah this question that's still open yeah okay very cool um so if uh, are there any further questions because if not then i would ask everyone to unmute themselves so that we can uh, thank matthew for giving a wonderful talk okay so thank you so much for joining and see you next time